this is the right talk to uh, close out the day. Um, it's been an amazing day of talks. Um, people have been extremely open and honest and vulnerable. I uh, heard a lot of people saying, that's not what I expected. It's been fantastic. Um, I'm going to give you exactly what you expect. It's going to be... <laughs> It's going to be a talk about the web, like always, pretty much, but um, eh, bear with me. Actually, I, I want to tell you about a word. And the reaction that I had to reading that word. Because I had a, a very big reaction to a very small word. This is the word was, the past tense of the verb to be. And I saw this word, and I was struck with a sense of awe. Now, obviously, it's not just uh, the word itself. Like, I don't get struck by feelings of awe every time somebody says the word was. Um, the context matters. So here's the context. I was reading the Wikipedia entry for smallpox. And don't ask me how I ended up here. <laughs> I, I don't remember. But I read the second word in the first sentence. Smallpox was. Ah, oh, I still get goosebumps. Um, and I think for the first time, like I, I really grasped what an astonishing achievement it is to eradicate a deadly disease. Like, we, we did that. Humans, using science. And I thought, you know, surely this, this must stand as one of the greatest achievements of our species. So, I was curious. I was curious as to how this was reported in the news at the time. So uh, I went searching through newspaper archives on the web to find out. Uh, here's an article on page 21 of the New York Times. It's five paragraphs long. And the first paragraph says, smallpox, one of the deadliest and oldest viral diseases of humans, has been eradicated, World Health Organization's officials said today in a news conference broadcast here from Geneva. And then a few paragraphs down, it says, uh, the health organization began the intensified smallpox eradication program in 1967. In that year, smallpox was reported in 42 countries and killed 2 million people. It also scarred and blinded another 8 million people in one year. And then, about 10 years later, the disease was eradicated. But it was a gradual process. And if something changes gradually, we don't notice it. We literally exhibit something called change blindness. But we're hardwired to notice sudden changes. We pay attention to moments of change. Where were you when JFK was assassinated? Where were you on September 11th? Nobody is ever going to ask, where were you when smallpox was eradicated? We mark the moments when an election is won or lost, the moment war breaks out, the moment a ceasefire is signed. And we seem to be particularly attuned to breaking changes, the moments when bad things happen. We're downright suspicious of good news. We have this phrase, sounds too good to be true. But we don't have this phrase, sounds too bad to be true. Now, there may well be solid evolutionary reasons for being attuned to danger and threats. But maybe we should occasionally take a step back and notice the changes we've been blind to. What if there were a newspaper that wasn't published daily or weekly, but once every 100 years? What would the headline on the front page be? Now, maybe it would be a moment like 
Yuri Gagarin went into space. Like, that's a pretty big one, right? But maybe the headline will be something we don't even think about. Maybe the headline will be about how many more people can read the headline. Adult literacy rates have skyrocketed over the last hundred years. And this is showing percentages, not raw numbers, because then the chart will be even more dramatic. What about a 50-year newspaper? What would the headline be? Well, maybe it would be about climate change, right? Burning coal and oil turns out to have been really bad. Or maybe the headline would be about the remarkable drop in extreme poverty. Now, any percentage is still too much. But still, look at that rapid fall, particularly over the last 25 years. Every single day, a real-time newspaper could have run the headline, 130,000 people escape extreme poverty today. But no newspaper has ever reported that. Sounds too good to be true. What about a newspaper published every 25 years? Now, maybe the headline would still be about that drop in extreme poverty, or maybe the headline would be about the equally steep drop in violent crime, or deaths in natural disasters. Or perhaps the editor would run with the story of infant mortality rates being halved. This time, we are looking at the raw numbers. If this were percentages of the world population, the effect would be even more dramatic. What about a newspaper published every 10 years? That's the time frame we're looking at here today, right? Now, for a newspaper published once a decade, I reckon today's headline probably would be about climate change and the environment. Like, maybe this is the most surprising development in the last 10 years, the huge increase in solar and wind energy. And there's a corresponding graph showing an equally dramatic drop in price especially with solar. Now, we could be looking at the beginning of an exponential curve here. Time will tell. But let's get more specific. Let's look at the World Wide Web. How has the web changed since I was standing here 10 years ago? Well, thanks to the Internet Archive, I can show what my own website looked like the moment I was speaking at the first border none. Now, let's compare this to how my website looks today. <laughs> yeah, not, not exactly an astonishing amount of change, is it? I think we need to go back further than 10 years. I think we need to go back all the way back. Bastian, I will see your 20 years and raise you to 30. This is the first website ever made, displayed in the first web browser ever made, both made by Tim Berners-Lee 30 years ago. And this website is still online today at its original URL, because it's cool. Now, the World Wide Web was somewhat lacking in color originally. When I started making websites in the mid-90s, Color had arrived, but uh, it was limited. We had our palette of 216 web-safe colors. You knew if a color was web-safe, if the hexadecimal notation was three sets of duplicated values. If you altered one of those values, even slightly, there was no guarantee that the color would display consistently on the monitors of the time. Confession time here. I kind of liked this constraint in, in a weird way. And to this day, if I've got a color value that's like almost web safe, I can't resist nudging it to be web safe. <laughs> now, fortunately, monitors improved because they got flatter, for one thing. Um, and they were also capable of displaying a lot more colors. And we got more ways of specifying colors, uh, as well as hexadecimal, we got uh, RGB, red, green, blue. Uh, better yet, we got RGBA with alpha transparency, which is opacity to you and me. Uh, then we got HSL, hue, saturation, lightness. 
uh, or should I say HSLA, hue, saturation, lightness, and alpha transparency. And there's more color spaces available today. Uh, HWB is like hue, whiteness, blackness, uh, LAB, LCH, and now we've got a color function so you can specify even more color spaces. Sounds too good to be true. Now, in the beginning, typography on the web was non-existent. Your browser used whatever was available on your operating system. And actually, that situation continued for quite a while. You'd have to guess which fonts were likely to be available on Windows or Mac. Like if you wanted to use a sans serif typeface, there was Arial on Windows uh, or Helvetica on the Mac. Verdana was a pretty safe bet too. And for a while, your only safe option for a serif typeface was Times New Roman. And when Matthew Carter's Georgia was released, it was a godsend, because here was a typeface designed specifically for the screen. Later, Microsoft released another four fonts designed for the screen. Four new fonts. Felt like we were being spoiled. <laughs> but what if you wanted to use a typeface that didn't come installed with an operating system? Well, you went into Photoshop and you made an image of the text. Now the user had to download an additional image, and the text wasn't selectable, and it was a fixed width. And we came up with all sorts of clever techniques to do what was called image replacement for text. And some of the techniques involved CSS and background images. One of the techniques involved flash. Remember Cipher, scalable Inman flash replacement? A later technique called Kufan converted the letter shapes into paths in canvas. Now, all of these techniques were hacks. They were very clever hacks, but they were hacks nonetheless. They were clever, they worked, but they always reminded me of Samuel Johnson's description of a dog walking on its hind legs. It is not done well, but you are surprised to find it done at all. <laughs> what if you wanted to use an actual font file in a web page. Well, there was one browser that supported font embedding, Microsoft's Internet Explorer. The catch was that you had to use a proprietary font format called embedded open type. See, both type foundries and browser makers, uh, they were nervous about allowing regular font files to be embedded in web pages. They worried about licensing. Uh, wouldn't this lead to even more people downloading fonts illegally? How would the licensing be enforced? And the impasse was broken with a two-pronged approach. First of all, we got a new format called Web Open Font Format, or WAF. And it could be used to take a regular font file and wrap it in a light veneer of metadata about licensing. And there's a sequel that's even better than the original, WAF 2. Electric Boogaloo. And the other breakthrough was the creation of intermediary services like Typekit and FontTech. And they would take care of serving the actual font files, making sure they couldn't be easily downloaded. And they could keep track of numbers to ensure that the type foundries were being compensated fairly. And over time, it became clear to the type foundries that most web designers wanted to do the right thing when it came to licensing fonts. So these days, you can probably license a font straight from the Type Foundry for use on the web and host it yourself. Now, you might need to buy a few different weights. Regular, bold, maybe italic. And what about extra bold or light weight? It all starts to add up, especially for the end user who has to download all those files. I remember being at the uh, Web Typography Conference, Ampersand, years ago and hearing a talk from Nick Sherman. And he asked us to imagine one single font file that could go from light to regular to bold and everything in between. And what he described sounded like science fiction. It is now science fact, indistinguishable from magic. Variable fonts are here. So you can typeset text on the web to be light or regular or bold or anything in between. 
Now, when you use uh, CSS to declare the font weight property, you can use keywords like normal or bold, but you can also use the corresponding numbers like 400 or 700. There's a scale with nine options from 100 to 900. Why isn't the scale simply one to nine? Well, even though the idea of variable fonts would have been pure fantasy when this part of CSS was being spec'd, the authors had some foresight. One of the reasons we chose to use three-digit numbers was to support intermediate values in the future. And with the creation of variable fonts, how can we only added, the future is now. On today's web, you could have 999 font weight options. Sounds too good to be true. Now, in the beginning, the web was a medium for text only. There were no images and certainly no videos. And in an early mailing list discussion, there was talk of creating a new HTML element for images. Perhaps it should be called icon. Or maybe it should be more generic and be called embed. Tim Berners-Lee said he imagined using the rel attribute on the A element for embedding images. Now, while this discussion was happening, Mark Andreessen, yeah, that guy, popped in to say that he had just shipped a new HTML element in the Mosaic browser. It's called IMG. It takes an attribute called SRC that points to the source of the image. And this was a self-closing tag, so there was no way to put fallback content in between the opening and closing tags. So, you know, nothing to display if the image couldn't be displayed. So the alt attribute, ALT, was introduced instead to provide an alternative description of the image. Now, for the images themselves, there were really only two choices. JPEG for photographic images and and GIF for icons <laughs> or anything that needed basic transparency. Now, GIFs could also do animation, and today that's pretty much all they're used for. And that's because there was a concerted campaign to ditch the GIF format on the web. Unisys, who owned the rights to a compression algorithm used by the GIF format, had started to make noises about potentially demanding license fees for its use. The Portable Network Graphics Format, or PNG, was created in response. It was more performant, and it allowed you to have proper alpha transparency. And these were all bitmap formats. What if you wanted a vector format for images that would retain crispness at any size or resolution? There was only one option, Flash. You'd have to embed a Flash movie in your web page just to get the benefit of vector graphics. Now, by the 21st century, there were some eggheads working on a text-based vector file format that could be embedded in web pages, but it sounded like a pipe dream. It was called SVG for Scalable Vector Graphics. The format was dreamed up in 2001, but for years, not a single web browser supported it. It was like some theoretical, graphical Shangri-La. <laughs> but by 2011, every major browser supported it. Stylable, scriptable, animatable vector graphics have gone from fantasy to reality. Sounds too good to be true. And there's more choice in the world of uh, bitmap images, too. WebP is well-supported. AVIF is gaining support, to, and the image element itself has grown. Uh, you can use the source set attribute to give the browser a range of images to choose from to best suit the user's device and network speed. You can use the loading attribute to get lazy loading of images for free, no JavaScript required. We now have audio in HTML, no JavaScript required. We now have video in HTML, no JavaScript required. And these elements have been designed with more thought than the image element. They are not self-closing by design. You can put fallback content 
between the opening and closing tags. Now, the audio and video elements arrived long after the image element. And for a long time, there was no easy way to do video or audio on the web. That was very frustrating for me. Uh, like Bastien, the first websites I ever built were for bands. I was living in Freiburg at the time, playing in bands. Literally, same story as Bastien. First website I ever made was for a band. One of those bands, by the way, is still going, and they're, they're really good now. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see Leopold Krauss Wellenkapelle, they are, they are the best surf rock band in the Black Forest. <laughs> the only way to stream music was with a proprietary plugin, like Real Audio, or Flash. Because while the web standards were still being worked on, Flash delivered the goods, streaming audio and video. And this happened over and over. Flash gave us uh, vector graphics, animation, video, and more. But the price was lock-in. Flash was a proprietary format. But still, Flash showed the web standards bodies the direction of travel. Flash was the hare, web standards were the tortoise. We know how that race ended. And in a way, Flash was like the research and development incubator for the World Wide Web. We got CSS animations, SVG, and streaming video because Flash showed that there was an appetite for them. Because until web standards provide a way to do something, designers and developers will reach for whatever tool gets the job done. Take layout, for example. Now, in the early days of the web, you could have any layout you wanted as long as it was a single column. <laughs> and before long, HTML expanded to provide some rudimentary formatting for that single column of text. Presentational elements and attributes were invented. And even when the elements and attributes weren't meant to be used for formatting, people got creative. Tables for layout, a single pixel GIF that could be given a width and a height. These were clever solutions, but they were hacks. And they were in danger of turning HTML into a presentational language instead of a language for structuring content. Now, CSS came to the rescue, a language specifically for presentation. But we still didn't get proper layout tools. And there was even a lot of debate in the early days about whether CSS should even attempt to provide layout tools or whether that was a job for a, a separate technology. Now, we could lay things out using the float property, but really, that was just another hack. Floats were an improvement over tables for layout, but we only swapped one tool for another. Our collective thinking still wasn't very web-like. For example, designers and developers insisted on building websites with a fixed width. Now, this started in the era of table layouts, and it carried over into CSS. To start with, the fixed width was 640 pixels. Then it was 800 pixels. Then people settled on the magical number of 960 pixels. You know, and designers and developers didn't seem to be at all concerned that people had different sized screens. That was until the iPhone came out, and everyone shat the bed. What fixed width are we supposed to design for now? Well, the answer was there all along. Even before the web appeared on mobile, it was possible to build fluid layouts that would adapt to screen size. It's just that the majority of designers and developers chose not to build that way. Now, I was pleased when, when mobile came along and shook things up because it exposed the assumptions that people were making. And it forced designers and developers to think in a more, a more fluid, webby way. And even better, CSS had expanded to include media queries, so it was possible to alter layouts at different breakpoints. Ethan came along and put a nice bow on it with his definition of responsive design. Fluid media, fluid layouts, media queries. Now, I fell in love with responsive design instantly because it kind of matched how I was already thinking about the web. Because I was one of the handful of weirdos who insisted on building fluid websites when everyone else was using fixed-width layouts. But 
I thought that responsive web design would struggle to take hold. I am delighted to say I was wrong. Responsive web design has become the default. If I could go back to my past self in the mid-2000s, I would love to tell them that in the future, everyone will be building with fluid layouts. And also the time travel had been invented, apparently. Not only that, but we finally have proper layout tools for the web. Flexbox, Grid, no more hacks. We've even got container queries, which for years we were told were literally too good to be true. Web browsers are now positively overflowing with fantastic design tools that would have been unimaginable to my past self. And support for these technologies is pretty much universal. When browsers differ today, it's only in terms of which standards they don't yet support. The web has come a long way. It has grown and evolved. Browsers have become more and more powerful while maintaining backward compatibility. You know, in the past, we had to hack our way around technological limitations of the web, and we had a long wish list of features we wanted. And I'm not saying we're done. I'm sure that more features will keep coming. But our wish list has shrunk. The biggest challenges facing the web today are not technical challenges. On today's web, it is possible to create beautiful websites that make full use of color, typography, layout, animation, and more. But this isn't what users experience. This is what users experience. A tedious, frustrating game of whack-a-mole with websites that claim to value our privacy while asking us to relinquish it. This is not a technical problem. It is a design decision. The decision might not have been made by anyone with the word designer in their job title, but make no mistake, business decisions have a direct effect on user experience. Now, on the face of it, the problem seems to be with the business model of advertising, but that's not quite right. To be more precise, the problem is with the business model of behavioral advertising. That relies on intermediaries to amass huge amounts of personal data so they can supposedly serve up relevant advertising. But contextual advertising, which serves up uh, ads based on the content you're looking at, doesn't require the invasive collection of personal data, and it works. Behavioral advertising, despite being a huge industry that depends on people giving up their privacy, doesn't even work very well. And on the few occasions when it does work, it just feels creepy. The problem is not advertising, the problem is tracking. And the greatest trick the middlemen ever pulled was convincing us that you can't have effective advertising without tracking. That is false. But they've managed to skew our sense of perspective so that invasive advertising seems inevitable. You know, advertising was always possible on the web. You could publish anything, and an ad is just one more thing you could choose to publish. But tracking was impossible. That's because the early web was stateless. A browser requests a resource from a server, and once that transaction is done, they both promptly forget about it. And that made it very hard to do things like uh, online shopping or logging into an account. And two technologies were created later that enabled state on the web, cookies and JavaScript. Now, if these technologies had been limited to a same origin policy, like how cookies were originally specified, they would have nicely solved the problems of online shopping and authentication. But these technologies work across domains. Third-party cookies and third-party JavaScript enables users to be tracked as they move from site to site. So the web has gone from having no state to having too much. But there is hope. 
Browsers like uh, Safari and Firefox are blocking third-party cookies by default. Personally, I would love it if third-party JavaScript got the same treatment. You can also install add-ons onto your browser to make it more secure, although these add-ons are often labeled ad blockers, which is a shame because the problem is not advertising, the problem is tracking. Now, perhaps none of this applies to you anyway. You may be thinking, this is a problem for websites, but you build web apps that don't rely on behavioral advertising. Now, as I said here 10 years ago, I'm not keen on the idea of dividing the entirety of the World Wide Web into two vaguely defined categories. 10 years on, I still have yet to hear a good definition of web app other than a website that requires JavaScript to work. But the phrase single page app has a more definite meaning. It refers to an architectural decision. And that decision is to reinvent the web browser inside a web browser. You know, in a sense, it's a testament to the power of JavaScript that you can choose to do this. Browsers render content and perform navigations. But hey, if you'd rather recreate that functionality from scratch in JavaScript, you can. But should you, though? Browsers have increased in complexity so that we can build without complexity. We can use the, the built-in power of modern HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to make web browsers do the work. You know, if we work with the grain of the web, we can accomplish more and more with less and less code. But that isn't what's happened. You know, instead, developers have recreated form controls like drop-downs and date pickers from scratch using divs and lashings and lashings of JavaScript. Now, perhaps this points to some missing features on the web, right? It's still, it's still too hard to style native drop-downs and date pickers, but that's being worked on, right? OpenUI.org, the standards work on the way to give us more styling over form elements, but that doesn't explain why developers would choose to recreate something like a button using divs and JavaScript, when the button element already exists and can be styled any way you like. I think there's a certain mindset being applied to web development here, and that mindset comes from the world of software. And again, it's a testament to how far the web has come that it can be treated as a software platform on par with operating systems like iOS, Android, and Windows. And there's a lot to be learned from the world of software, like testing, for example. But the web is different. When a user navigates to a URL, it shouldn't feel like they're installing a piece of software. We should be aiming to keep our, our payloads as small as possible. And given how powerful browsers have become, we need fewer and fewer dependencies. But performance has gotten worse. Payloads have gotten bigger. Dependencies like JavaScript frameworks have become more and more widespread even as they became less and less necessary. Now, when asked to justify the enormous payloads, web developers have responded by saying that users' expectations have changed. And that is correct, but not in the way that I think they mean. Because when I talk to people about using the web, especially on mobile, their expectations are that they will have a terrible experience, that websites will be slow to load. And I guarantee you that none of them are saying, yeah, well, I'd be annoyed if this was a website, but seeing as this is a web app, I'm absolutely fine with this terrible experience. Now, I said that the biggest challenges facing the World Wide Web today are not technical challenges. And I think the biggest challenge facing the web today is people's expectations. There is no technical reason for websites or web apps to be so frustrating. But we have collectively led people to expect a bad experience on the web. Now, our intentions may have been good. We thought users wanted nice page transitions and form elements that were on brand. But if you talk to people, you find out what they want is to accomplish their task without megabytes of JavaScript getting in the way. It's my favorite German word. Verschlimmbessern. <laughs> the act of making something worse than the attempt to make it better. And perhaps we verschlimmbessert the web. So let's step back. 
get some perspective. Instead of assuming that a single-page app architecture is needed, ask what users need to accomplish. Instead of assuming you need a CSS framework or a JavaScript library, see what you can do in browsers today with native CSS and vanilla JavaScript. Don't include a bunch of dependencies by default just in case you might need them. Instead, as Rachel puts it, stop solving problems you don't yet have. I quoted this on stage here 10 years ago. I'm quoting it again today. Lean into what web browsers can accomplish today. Now, if you find something's missing, that's the time to reach for a library. But treat it like a polyfill. Whereas web standards stick around, every library and framework comes with a limited lifespan. Treat them as cattle, not pets. Now, I understand that the tools and frameworks can make your life easier. And if we're talking about server-side frameworks, and I say, go for it, or you're using build tools that sit on your computer to do uh, version control, linting, uh, pre-processing, transpiling, I say, go for it. But once you make users download tools or frameworks, you're making them pay a tax for your developer convenience. We need to value user needs above developer convenience. If I have the choice of making something the user's problem or making it my problem, I'll make it my problem every time. That's my job. We need to change people's expectations of the World Wide Web, especially on mobile. Otherwise, the web will be lost. In 2019, uh, I had the great honor of being invited to CERN to mark the 30th anniversary of the original proposal for the World Wide Web. Uh, one of the other people there was the journalist, Zeynep Dufeci. Um, she was on this panel along with Tim Berners-Lee and other luminaries of the early web. And at the end of the panel discussion, she was asked, what would you tell the next generation about how to use this wonderful tool? And she replied, if you have something wonderful, if you do not defend it, you will lose it. If you do not defend the magic and the things that make it wonderful, it's not just going to stay magical by itself. I believe that we can save the web. I believe that we can change people's expectations. And we'll do that by showing them what the web is capable of. Thank you.